Coming up on the Civil Discourse, scholar and professor Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg discusses family dynamics in Genesis, the character of the biblical Moses, and other insights into the Hebrew Bible. They're not stories that aim to harmonize between parts of the text and say, oh, really, it's all one smooth uh, text. They actually point up the psychological depths that are involved in the characters, that the characters represent, which makes things jagged rather than smooth. Hello and welcome to The Civil Discourse. I'm Paula Morantz Cohn, Professor of English and Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University, speaking to you from my office at Bentley Hall in West Philadelphia. Today my guest is Professor Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg, an expert in biblical scholarship and commentary. Born in London, raised in Scotland, and living in Israel, Dr. Zornberg has taught at institutions around the world. Her interpretations of the Hebrew Bible are based on a range of eclectic sources, literary fiction and theory, psychoanalysis and philosophy, and rabbinical commentaries. She's the author of six books, including The Beginning of Desire, Reflections on Genesis, which won the National Jewish Book Award, Moses, A Human Life, and most recently, The Hidden Order of Intimacy, Reflections on Leviticus. Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg, welcome to the Civil Discourse. Thank you, it's good to be here. Well, you grew up in Glasgow, Scotland, as the daughter of a rabbi who was head of the rabbinical court of Scotland. Yes. And how did this immersion in Jewish life in a context not normally associated with Judaism shape your viewpoint and your vocation? I think it was an extraordinary upbringing in a way, because my father was a very considerable scholar, he was a very serious scholar in an environment that had really no traditions of that kind. There, were, there was a very healthy Jewish community in Glasgow, a very lovely community, but not orthodox and not religious. In other words, not learned also, that's one of the implications. And he made it his task, as I felt was the task of every Jewish father throughout history, to educate his children. If there wasn't a public education system available in these Jewish areas, then he had to provide it. So that I emerged from that period knowing more, I would say, of Jewish, the Jewish literature, of, of the history, of, of, of the, the depth of the text. He brought to the study a great depth and a great depth of experience. I can see that your father was very important to you. Yes. A great, a great influence. I would like to go into that more, but I want to move into your period of education at Cambridge. Yes. Again, another patriarchal institution and a very elite one with Oxford, the two most elite universities in England, uh, closed to Jews until the end, I believe, of the 19th century, as well as to women. Mm -hmm. And I wonder about that experience and how you felt at Cambridge coming from, I guess, a kind of immersion in Jewish life with your father in Glasgow. Yes, that's true. But then there was the other culture, always. And the other culture was my schooling, my general schooling, and my tremendous love of English literature and of language, of the, of the English language. And really, I was very steeped. That was the other culture. I was very steeped in the sensibility, I would say, of someone who is very, very, what can I say, an integral part of that culture. The English novel was in my blood, was in my, huh. in my, in my I blood. I feel the same way. So we are, yeah. we are kindred spirits in that That's way. Cool. Yes. And interestingly, yeah, the person who I think of as my mentor, Lionel Trilling, yeah. was the first Jewish person to get tenure in the English department at Columbia University. 
but I know you wrote your PhD dissertation on George Eliot, yes. uh, which is, was the pen name of Marion Evans, who was considered the most knowledgeable, the most educated person, not just woman, of her time. She began her career, her writing career, working with Christian theology, and then later moved away from that. And her last novel, Daniel Deronda, deals with a Jewish char character who is brought up as an English aristocrat and discovers he's Jewish and, and later goes to found a, help found a Jewish state in Palestine. And you wrote your dissertation on Eliot, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts about her and about Daniel Deronda. Again, a very <laughs> deep subject for me. I was not so much interested in, in the Jewish aspect of her. I was interested in her. She was a kind of alter ego, I think, for me. I found reading her letters as well as her novels much ground for similarity, for identification. Um, a woman who is in some way strange to her environment has elements in her that people are just not used to. Um, the sense somewhere of being different, of being a blue stocking, of being, being someone for whom the life of the mind and the soul was very important, and also the religious life. The religious life, in a certain sense, remained very important to George Eliot, even after she had officially let it go as a dogma. Um, she, she is interested always in her writing, in the ways that those sensibilities, religious sensibilities, translate into the ethical sphere, translate into the right life for a human being. Very high-minded. Such a moralist and uh, sort of out of, out of vogue yeah. now because of her moral earnestness, really, but that is yeah. such a wonderful element in her writing. She was very funny. You laugh aloud when you read her, if you, if you are really reading. I identified with her mightily, and she was my, my beacon. <laughs> if one is going to have a beacon, it should be, I think, George Eliot. Um, anyway, your first book, The Beginning of Desire, Reflections on Genesis, which was much acclaimed, you discuss passages in Genesis that involve family dynamics and intergenerational dynamics, and most notably that famous passage of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac at God's command. And this passage, which is known as the Akedah, or binding, since Isaac is bound as Abraham prepares him for sacrifice, is interrupted when Abraham's hand is stopped at the last moment by an angel sent by God. You draw on a range of sources from ancient to modern, from religious to secular, in your discussion. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you derive from this extraordinarily evocative and dramatic and traumatic passage. Well, one of the things that fascinated me was a kind of oblique angle on the subject. And that was the question of Abraham's wife, Sarah, and a whole Midrashic tradition that shines a spotlight on the way she died. Her death is reported in the next chapter, after that chapter to deal, dealing with the sacrifice of Isaac. And the connection that's made between her death and the news that she receives of the almost sacrifice of her son. In the Midrashic traditions, there are a whole cluster of counter narratives of narratives that focus in on that that fissure in the in the in the text that crack in the text between the sacrifice of a father and a son a father sacrificing a son and the woman who is left at home the mother who is left at home and receives a kind of horrific and traumatic mode of storytelling she is told the story in such a way that all her belief in the world seems to collapse. And these are very modern themes. That is the idea somewhere of the woman having a different perspective and of, in a sense, the fragility of a world that is based on a certain kind of trust and where the trust is in some way affected. 
And she's no longer sure when she receives the news of how much she can trust her husband. It's a very rich literature. I can't overemphasize that. Um, and that was part of my interest in discussing this. Um, the Abraham himself, I tend to think, I mean, what I've what I've elaborated on, what I've talked a lot, of, a great deal about, is the fact that he is not entirely sure that it really is God's voice. There's a kind of radical uncertainty in his mind, which again is a very modern concept. It, it only goes back whether as it's far God's as... voice that wants him to yes. sacrifice his yes. son, yes. or whether yes. it's an Oedipal kind of, uh... or yeah. Or simply that that was the fashion at that time. That was the theological fashion in the ancient Near East, that fathers did sacrifice their their sons to Molech. And Abraham cannot be quite certain that the voice that's now telling him to do this is the voice of the new religion, the new ethical religion that he has bought into, or whether it's some kind of, as you say, some kind of survival of, you know, of an old pagan an old pagan prejudice of some kind. And again, there's a, just to put it like that, it's very stark. But when you begin to bring in details from the text and from the Midrashic sources, an, an extraordinarily multicolored and profound narrative emerges that treats Abraham as someone who is, could be a, a modern person. It is really wonderful the way you tease apart that extraordinary story. And I guess the way the commentators did, because you follow on them and you elaborate on them. But something you said about Sarah, the mother, and I, and in your book you deal with this, that her death, which she died at a very old age, something like 120-some years, um, but it's, it's positioned so that it's near the near sacrifice. Yes. And her coming to terms with the fragility, well, you put it, the fragility, the contingency of life. It's almost like a second fall, the bringing of death into the world in the garden. This is another awareness, isn't it, of death for a mother with respect to her child. I think that is such a powerful idea. The idea of death, all the generations have got very used to death. People are born and die. But the idea that her husband could sacrifice her son without telling her anything about it, and that he was almost slaughtered, that is the emphasis in the Midrashic sources, almostness of life, that, you know, all right, so he, he survived. How does that help with the traumatic impact of that kind of narrative, of a, of a life that could end just like that because of, of God's command? So there's something there with large resonance. And the interesting thing is, as far as I understand it, that the rabbinic sources don't disapprove of her for having this crisis. On the contrary, they give her credit and they say, in fact, we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, on the New Year, which is one of the most sacred rituals, in memory of her wailing of, the, of that woman's wailing at the moment she got those tidings. It also underlines her distance from the action itself. Yes. Abraham is the one who has called upon to act, and she's called upon to stay home. There's a poignancy to that, I think, that speaks to women, at least in traditional roles, um, that reverberates into the near present. Yes. And, that, and the result of that is, of course, that she is dependent on narrative. Someone has to come and tell her the story. And in the Midrash, it's a malevolent Satan who comes and distorts the story somewhat, and in fact tries to pretend in one version that it was successful, the slaughter was actually completed. In other versions, it's not Satan, it's Isaac himself who comes back in the very flesh, right? no distortion and tells her a story about what almost happened. That's fascinating. And uh, you bring, bring up what I think some of our viewers would not know, which is you have the Bible story, which is very spare, very simple. Um, and yet you have commentators in the Midrash, and I, I hope you'll define the Midrash for us, 
including the famous commentator Rashi. And of course, the Bible has that potential richness in its spare outline that it's possible to fill in as you have and they have. Can you explain the Midrash and talk a little bit about Rashi? Well, Rashi, let me just date it first. Rashi was the commentary in the 11th century in France. He's considered the prime commentary in the traditional Jewish body of, of, of commentary. And he makes great use of Midrash. What is, what is Midrash? Midrash, technically speaking, is a body of commentary on the, on the Torah, on the Bible, um, from, from, dating from around the second, the third to the 10th century, maybe closer to the third century. Um, and this includes all kinds of auxiliary narratives that fill in gaps in the text. And where biblical criticism might come in in the 20th and 19th century and say, ah, two different sources. The Midrash also notices the gaps and tries to, to make something of it, which has to do often with a kind of tension between parts of the story, acknowledges there's a gap and fills in with the, the, the crags and gaps, let's say, of the inner life of, of, of human beings, which means that the story can't be smooth and harmonious, you know? Uh, the fact that she dies, it's in the, in the way of the world. The fact that she dies straight after the Akedah is not in the way of the world. That's, that's already, it invites attention. You yeah. know, you must read that. In a way, that's a very modern conception that the Midrash has, that everything that uh, strikes you as inharmonious and, and incoherent is there for a reason. And it's, it's for up to us to try to understand what effect it's supposed to be making, what stories it gives birth to. And that, I think, is a tradition of a certain, many of us who happen to be Jewish and are interested in interpretation. It seems to me that that is um, part of our, our, our ancestry um, and that the desire to fill those gaps, as you put it, to explain the disjunction. It's fascinating to me. Yes, yes, it is. It is fascinating. It's an alternative way of telling stories. I would say really very modern or, or postmodern stories yeah. because they're not stories that aim to harmonize between parts of the text and say, oh, really, it's all one smooth uh, text. They actually point up the psychological depth that are involved in the characters that the characters represent which makes things jagged rather than smooth. Now, the unconscious is something, in fact, you have a book, The Biblical Unconscious, is something you're very interested in. Much of your work involves use of Freudian theory, psychoanalysis. Have you gotten pushback from biblical scholars in terms of using some of this material, which they might feel goes against the grain, whether it's spiritually or in terms of a certain I don't know whether there's a certain style of biblical scholarship that tends to be, you know, foremost. What, what, what kinds of encounters have you had with rabbis and, and scholars in, in your area? Well, I would have to say that I haven't had pushback to my face. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine, maybe my paranoid imagination, that, uh, that there is some raising of eyebrows. You know, why do I take it that seriously? Freud doesn't have a good name among uh, orthodox religious scholars on the, on the whole, but it depends what kind of orthodox. Again, more enlightened, more, more um, secularly educated people take Freud in their, in their stride, but the, Freud is somewhat in disfavor now, I would have to say. Um, and I, I, th I still think he has a great deal to offer, and certainly the movement the interest in the unconscious has evolved and offers, I'm, I'm totally at peace myself with the use of this kind of lens to look at a text as, as, as fraught as this. I couldn't agree more. And of course, Freud was a great storyteller and the yeah. ability to, to t make a narrative out of, out of a human life um, yeah. is very much part of what he de deals with, with the unconscious. And you do this again in your latest book on Moses, 
you are concerned with Moses as someone, a modern figure in many ways, or someone that we can learn from. Can you perhaps encapsulate some of your insights about Moses? And the book is Moses, A Human Life for our audience. The title is taken from a letter by Kafka, who says that the reason Moses never gets to enter the land of Canaan, the Holy Land, in spite of a lifelong desire, is that his life is a human life. Even if he had lived hundreds of years, he would never have made it, because that's the nature, the incomplete nature of human life. And that's Kafka. It's very Kafkaesque. But I find it mirrored in Again, the Midrashic traditions, the sense of the, the, the enigma and the outrage in a way of betrayal that Moses feels when God holds to that decree that he, he will not enter the land. The people will enter, but after 40 years of journeying, Moses will, will end up on this side of the, of the river. Now that clearly there is a sense of, of cruelty about that. If you look closely at the text, what I get from it is that God is delicately turning Moses back to his people. Stop talking to me. You're, you've had a wonderful relationship with me all your life. That, that has been the main relationship of your life, the intimacy with God. The people somewhere have been left at the bottom of the mountain. You, you need to pay much more attention now to them and to what you will leave them with. And the speeches of the book of Deuteronomy, in large measure, bear that out, that Moses is humanized during that book. And we get a sense of the human pathos of his life, and which affects his relationship to the people in the end. So they remember him not only as an awesome figure, but really in an intimate way, as a teacher, as a human being, as someone who shared human flesh you know, with them, who was, who was one of them. And how does that connect to his being prevented? Is it, is it an either or sort of thing that he has to live in the present somehow and not project himself? Is that your point? I think my point is that, <laughs> how would I put it? I don't think God explains himself. God doesn't explain himself at all. So it's left unexplained. He dies on the top of a mountain, this side of the Jordan, looking out over the land, which is somehow characteristic of the human life. You know, you're looking into the future from a distance, you don't get to set foot on yeah. it. That's yeah. not an explanation. That's not, it's no, not an explanation. But that's an image that's very, yeah. very yeah. evocative. Yeah. Um, one more question, we're running out of time here. It's interesting that you are so devoted to Judaism and to the spiritual element of Judaism. Your writing is very eclectic, as I had mentioned. And you're a feminist, it seems to me. I don't know if you call yourself that, but certainly in the kinds of concerns that crop up in your writing. And yet Judaism, like so many religions, is a patriarchal one, and sometimes rigidly so. How do you reconcile that? I mean, is that something you struggle with? My struggles have not been exactly in that area. Um, I have a lot of sympathy and love for younger women who are pushing the boundaries. Now, younger religious women, strictly religious women, who in different ways are pushing the boundaries, retaining their respect and love for the texts. Um, and that I find a very, to be a very creative movement. It's a movement that inspires me. And even if there are things I would, I think I would, I personally wouldn't have wanted to be a rabbi. But when I see that there are young women who are doing that, a good part of me is cheering them on, is thinking, yes, the time has come. Even though it's discordant in some sense with, with some of the texts. You're working in a context which is sort of the opposite from the one I'm in, in that you are within a context of biblical scholars who are very traditional. And you're more modern, whereas I feel more traditional within a context of more modern literary scholars who, ah, you know, it, who yes. are sort of chipping away at some of these texts that we find so sacred, you know, that we love and that feel, give such sustenance and which are, you know, sort of being dismissed or yeah. just 
you know, or distorted, denigrated, or ignored. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I wouldn't give up. I wouldn't give up so soon. <laughs> no, and the students, when you teach these back. works, they, they love it. They love them. And I love the way you bring this smorgasbord, so to speak. It's certainly, to me, very much a woman's way of thinking about these texts. Yes. You know? I agree. You bring in everything. It's like you're making a stew. That, that I think, is some, has something of the postmodern. Um, yes, it is. Things in a yeah. way that you like. You know, I think it's, you need it. In order to say something nuanced, you, you need to bring in all sorts of side lights. But keeping in view the greatness of the text, and I think the text is great because, as you say, it lends itself to so much. Yes. So I want to thank you for, for joining us. Thank you. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today at the Civil Discourse.